and I just lost my presentation. There it is. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking about anterior sphix with direct composites. Uh, I practice uh, full-time four days a week, and I teach at NYU Dental College. So I'm a wet finger dentist. I, I try to share my, uh, my uh, techniques with my colleagues and give you as much insight as the way I'm thinking and the way we approach uh, each patient treatment. We'll be seeing about eight different patient treatments today, uh, covering the gamut of anterior teeth and uh, single units and how do we approach uh, some repairs and using different uh, materials and uh, techniques. I've been a professor at uh, Pro uh, prosthodontics at NYU for 18 years and have uh, educated uh, many individuals and it's really a uh, great place to be to share ideas and really keep learning uh, with my colleagues and my mentors. So if you ever get a chance to come to New York, it's changed, it's very new, it's very up to date. I think you'd really appreciate it if you get to uh, if you get to come by. Our practice is on. Oh, sorry. Our practice is in Manhattan, on Fifth Avenue. We have uh, four prosthodontists and two general dentists, and uh, we practice all types of dentistry um, except for orthodontics and surgery. Uh, we have the specialists come in, and I think it's a great environment to learn. Uh, again, if you're in Manhattan and you want to come by, we're always open to our colleagues and around the world uh, to visit. So materials, it's always the, the question of what materials we use and you know there's a plethora of different materials and we'll show you some of the techniques that we are uh, using today. It's changed uh, every couple of years. We reevaluate where we are and what the new materials are. So constantly checking new materials that are in the market and hopefully uh, trying to get better uh, as much as we can with our patients. So let's look at the literature first the different types of composite with different sizes, uh, different research papers. Uh, you can go into the internet and find many of them. Uh, we like the microhybrids at this point. They're 0.7 micron uh, particle, which kind of, if you look at the chart here, this is from, um, from uh, Rafael Yage's paper, which is about 0.7. So we're looking about these fine finishing microfillers but they have a little bit of a hybrid in them, so it makes them really nice in terms of strength. And then uh, if you look at Bruce Le LeBlanc, you can look him up. He's a really great uh, authority on composites, uh, depending on what you choose. Uh, some of the new companies have uh, put some resin-modified glass ionomers, but we're really still sticking to the polyacid-modified composites resins around this area and really staying away from that just because of the shrinkage that glass ionomer spents have uh, shown, so we don't really promote that unless we're doing aligners. Aligners are very good with glass ionomer. Uh, Fowl's paper and John Weston's paper, again, you can look these up. We definitely believe in the uh, building up techniques, so we put a, a, a multiple layer. You'll see a lot of the cases have this lingual layer. Uh, you can use a matrix, you can use a clear matrix, you can use your finger. I really don't think it matters what you use as long as you get a good solid bond over here and gives you a good area to start building up your different colors. You'll see me doing a lot of the, the matrix on the lingual and then a, a base color of dentin, which usually A3 is my favorite, uh, unless it's a, a lighter color and maybe I go to A1, but usually A3 is a great color to give you a good base. And then I'll always put a one layer of, let's say, uh, um, an A1, and then I'll finalize it whatever color I'm going for. Uh, if you stay in the A1s and B1 ranges, if that's your goal, your final setting, then you want to start off usually two shades lighter. So if I'm here, if I'm finishing up with a B1, I'll start with an A2. If I'm finishing up with an A1, I'll start with an A3. If I'm finishing up very light, like super light or OM3 and super shades, then I may do my base as an A1. So I usually step back two or three colors from my uh, original uh, color. Um, a lot of the research comes out with different uh, organic materials in terms of the etching technique, in terms of the dentin bonding technique. I really believe from the people that I've talked to uh, around the country and the papers that I've read, uh, that really the, the, the dental bonding, these are dental tubules you see in the background, that's what really causes the sensitivity. So we believe, even though the manufacturers will say to put the dentin bonding agents for, let's say, 15 seconds or 20 seconds, 
we found if we leave it on for 45 seconds, these dental tubes are really filling up with the dentin bonding material and really reduced our sensitivity extremely by, by in increasing the time of the, um, the dentin bonding uh, materials. Also, it's been talked about using flowables on the base. We do use that sometimes, again, for the deeper uh, um, type of restorations, but for the anteriors, we don't really need to do that. We're going to just layer our technique. The curing light also is an issue in terms of are you curing the light uh, instantly or are you curing it slowly? Uh, definitely take your, tomorrow, the biggest tip I can give you is take your, your, your curing light and go ahead and use your, your monitor and measure it and make sure that it's curing in the right position. So we don't believe in an incremental cure, we believe in a full cure, uh, and we really go up to 30 seconds with our cures. Um, there's very different materials. I'm just going to share again what we use. We use ultra-dent hybrid, nano-hybrid, uh, nano-composite, and micro-composite. Aesthetics is one of my favorites, but a lot of the beautiful colors come from this Amilogen ultra-dent product. Again, there's many different one types, and I know people have different uh, um, preferences, and that's up to you to decide. Uh, we use uh, the, uh, I'll show you in a second, uh, the dentin bonding, and then we use our OptiBond 1FL, 2FL, so they're pretty pretty much put in a container and dipped in, and we'll do a 45-second a se uh, 45 cure with, uh, sorry, 45-second wait for the dentin bonding, and then a 15-second cure for the dentin bonding, and then we, we do our 1FL and 2FL, we'll do our 20-second bond, and then we'll start with our clear matrix and our cervical matrix. We use Luxaflow a lot for uh, nice aesthetic margins and aesthetic uh, incisal edges. And we'll definitely use a lot of Luxacore for any non-vital teeth or buildup of a big block of uh, composite. We don't like to build it up with the regular composite. We like to layer it. So one of my always, my, my always suggestion is you take your, your material, whatever you feel, sorry about that, whatever you feel uh, you'd like to do and get your own samples. You know, whatever composite you're using, Make your own samples. Uh, look at the different colors. This is ours from Translucent, Pearl Frost, Pearl Amber, and B1 from Ultradent. Um, and they really, you know, you know, it gives you a, a different shape and a contour. You polish it so you really can see the what you can do with your composites. I think that's the best way to, to do it. A lot of companies promise a lot of things, and it's really hard to evaluate. So I kind of make my own. I polish it to make sure that I have the right color when I'm choosing the right color. So here's the dentin bond adhesive. We leave that on for 45 seconds, and then we do a cure. So something like this, where we're isolating our first after we have so the first thing we do is our dentin bond. That's you see the tip right here, and this is the way it looks. It's from uh, Ivoclar. It's a Viva pen. Uh, we use the Excite or the adhesive one. They both basically work about the same. But here's the real uh, the trick to this is that it contains potassium uh, nitrate, which is found in all the sensodyne and all the uh, desensitization. Uh, toothpaste because that's really what it does. It uses the potassium nitrate. So we found when we went to 45 seconds, uh, we found a major decrease in our sensitivity. So we use that consistently on any cementation of uh, veneers or crowns or anything we're doing resin bonded or resin building up. We're, we're, we're dentin etching and we're uh, enamel etching and we're putting on dentin filler there for 45 seconds and then curing it for about 15. After that, it's a regular bonding technique or a regular cementation technique. Uh, the diamond burrs that you're going to be seeing, I'm covering all the, the literature now, so we'll just get to the cases at the end. Uh, the diamond burrs we use are from Brassler, but you can use any burr you want. You'll see the different shapes that we use. So we always have to, I like uh, contouring back and sculpting. So I don't use a matrix unless I'm doing major multiple units, four or six. I use build up and I like to cut back. So we'll do diamond contouring with the red fine diamonds. Then we'll do carbide finishing. And then we'll do composite rubber wheels, slow speed, and of course the Soflex disc that have been really uh, in, uh, manifest themselves in the last uh, five years as one of the best uh, polishing systems. Here they are here, the Soflex disc and the rubber wheels from Shofu or Brass that we use either one. Um, I didn't get a chance to take a photo of my NYU bird kit, so please um, uh, email me, drdean17 at AOL.com. Um, sorry, yeah, now drdean17 at AOL.com, and I'll send you the photo of the bird kit. 
if you're interested, uh, it's, it's been working great at NYU for us, and uh, most of the participants really enjoy it. And believe it or not, the Robinson brush has been a wonderful addition to our polishing techniques. And once I'm finished with the Soflex, you'll see some of the, uh, the polishing wheels that we use, the Robinson brush, and most of you have this for dental school. Uh, maybe you don't even know why they gave it to us in dental school, but I'm using it for my composite. And, and obviously the, the soft one is what we use. The extra stiff and standard will take away the composite, but the soft one really gives it a nice, beautiful luster. So let's go look at our techniques. We're looking at incisal edge position is the first thing that I look at anteriorly. So I stand up the patient, I look at the incisal edge position of any patient, and I kind of look at them and try to figure out what's my favorite tooth. I try to pick my favorite tooth, whether it's 8 or 9 or 7 or 10, and find that incisal edge position. I'll recreate it, and then once I recreate it, then at least I know where I'm going in terms of the edge position. Uh, the proportions are always an issue, and we'll see some of the patient treatments we're going to see. Uh, the proportion from central to central, from lateral to lateral, and trying to make that a nice uh, adjustment. The adjacent teeth always play a role. Sometimes we're doing a single unit and we're matching uh, an adjacent lateral, but the lateral has a lot of craze lines on it, uh, or it has a cervical lesion that we want to just kind of fix. So I'll always change the environment. I believe in changing the environment, changing the occlusion to make the restoration work. And of course, the layering, as we discussed, and different matrices that you'll see today. And then the colors are the shades before preparation. We want to look at the enamel shade, the dentin shade, and try to evaluate that. But again, I like using my own shade guides because the shade guides from the companies may not really match exactly with the material that you're using. And again, the dentin shades to evaluate that. The other part is, again, the colors before you prepare uh, materials and make them from your shade guides. Evaluate them with the natural teeth. Take the photographs. Uh, I think I recommended always uh, taking photographs with a regular SLR camera. It really gives you a good idea. You'll see some of the photos today, how they really depict pack the real color so you really get a sense of what you're doing. And typically step back the color. So if the company is telling me it's an A3, uh, or it's an A, I'm sorry, if the company is saying it's giving me an A1 shade, I'll use that for a B1. If I want to get an A2 shade, I'll use an A3 block or an A3 composite. It's always lighter, comes up lighter because it's very thin. And as we make our composites uh, and we're layering our anteriors, I find that the A3s start looking like A2s, and the A2s start looking like A1s, and, and so forth. Change the environment. I talk about occlusion, adjacent teeth. Sometimes you have to close spaces between teeth. And sometimes the opposing teeth have uh, sharp edges. So we want to always kind of change the environment to make our restorations last. Try to make the texture smooth or, or, or rough. Sometimes the teeth are textured, so we kind of analyze the teeth. We'll look at some of the patient treatments we're going to see and we'll analyze it beforehand. See if they have incisal trans or if they have more whiter blends. And then for the mock-ups, you know, I love using the flowable composites to do the mock-ups. It really works well for the patient. It's very, very quick. And we also use a lot of them for provisionals that we use, uh, composite for provisionals that really look pretty. And then the core buildup material, which I'll show you, and some of the color blockouts. So we're going to be talking today about mandibular incisor, composite repairs, maxillary canine, maxillary central, multiple anterior units, diagnostic wax up, and the anterior implant provisional, which I'll show you how we use some materials that really make an anterior implant look really pretty as a provisional. So let's start off with our mandibular incisor. See it here, it's just a little crack on it. Uh, and again, the, 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 er, my early years, I used to just prepare a little bit of the surface. What we do now is we prepare the facial in a semilunar fashion and the lingual. So you'll see the preparation on the lingual. This is the facial. So I want to get a nice blend of the composite. I don't want to just end it here in terms of strength, in terms of wear, in terms of polishability. I just like to cover more of the tooth. I have a very, very thin margin here. And then again on the lingual. So I'm basically wrapping around the lingual and the facial with the composite instead of just adding an incisal edge. As you see here, this was done a while back from my, with my partner. Uh, it's kind of surviving, but it's chipping on the lingual, it's chipping around. So I kind of bring it down and get a semilunar uh, preparation. Here's the lingual preparation down here. It's actually a little bit more aggressive because I want it to sit there on a nice uh, buff joint margin. And we'll put our matrix in and we'll just start. So this is the, becomes an A3 composite I'm starting to build up. Now if you see the top part, I don't just layer it. I actually use another matrix that comes on top and actually compresses the composite down. We did a study back in uh, 1995 
about compressing composite and about just layering with, with a plastic instrument. And what we found was when we compressed it and we looked at the SEM, the particles of these composites were much more um, uh, compressed on their SEM. So we believe in compressing as much as we can with our uh, anteriors. So I've layered the first one A, A3 and now I've laid another A2 on it. Kept the interproximal now we're just going to start polishing. So that's pretty much straightforward. Interproximal with different burrs and different uh, strippers and try to get it there. So you can see the delineation here very, very slow, lightly. You can see the delineation, but it blends a lot easier than just putting it on the edge. Uh, and that's the final polish. That's a pretty easy lower side. But again, wrapping it around is the bigger technique that has survived my composites uh, for the long term. Small areas of composite repair. Take a look at here where a patient has some cervical erosion areas. She wants to make it a little pretty. She can't really afford veneers and it's really not even indicated. So we want to go ahead and uh, definitely uh, probe this using a probe and find out where the defect ends. If you find a defect is way up there, then you may have to do a surgical procedure to really clean it up because if we just patch it to the gingival and there's another uh, defect going more lingual, there may be uh, some decay and in, infection in the long term. So we want to really probe it and feel it with our probe or with our explorer and make sure that there's no continuing of the uh, defect all the way up to the gum. There usually isn't. I haven't found it to be too deep, maybe a millimeter. So just evaluating that is pretty uh, important. So we'll retract. And once you retract also, you can kind of feel around and you start seeing the, um, uh, the, 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 the nice smooth uh, uh, cementum in there and then you know at least you're in a safe spot. So we'll go ahead and again scratch the semilunar, scratch the enamel semilunar there. Because remember, dentin bond is not that strong as, as the enamel bond, so we want to get a little bit of the enamel bond uh, working for to our benefit here. And again, you could some people like to make an actual margin. For these types of small repairs, it's basically a feather edge. When I go around on the lingual, you'll see a lot of them have a, a certain butt joint because I need support for the occlusion. But here, I uh, just want to grab a little bit of the enamel to help you get a good uh, enamel bond. And here's one of the things we discovered. These cervical matrices are really, uh, really helped us out to really get a beautiful contour. They're made by different people like Cure Through or Garrison Dental. And uh, we use them posteriorly. We use them anteriorly. Uh, I use them incisally, as you saw in my mandibular tooth. Um, and really gets a good contour for uh, any anterior cer cervical or posterior cervical areas. Again, they're different colors and different sizes. So I think something to look look at. I think it really help your uh, aesthetics on your cervical cases. So we see here, we, we usually, I want to tell you what's underneath here. We started with the dentin bond, we cured it. Then we put the 2FL and the 1FL. We did not cure it, right, because it's a really small, thin area. So I don't want to cure and cure and cure because I have different layers. So the only part I first cured was the dentin bond. Then we put the 2FL loose. We did not, we did not uh, bond it. Then we put our flowable just to wrap around the seal and then put my composite. So basically a layering of the three materials, compressing it, as you see here, light curing it all together so the whole bond gets kind of sealed right onto the dentin bond. And then we've taken it off here and then we re-cure it one more time. Again, leaving the retraction cordage, but look at the uh, nice contour that it gives the, the tooth, and it really makes your, your life easier when you uh, start polishing. So here we do our initial polish, take out the cord, do our initial polish at the cervical, make sure the cervical is very, very clean. We usually use a diamond for that. So we go diamond, fine diamond, uh, mosquito burr, all the way around, make sure we got a good, clean uh, finish there. And then we'll go back with the carbide 12 fluted, and then we'll go with the rubber wheels and then we'll go with the Robinson brush. So we wind up like that two weeks later. We got a really good finish and you see, you see a little bit of the delineation here, but pretty much you go with your Explorer and you have a very nice finish. And I think the combination of the 2FL, the flowable, and the composite together really gives it a good seal. Now, every now and then, I may get a little bit of a dip here or a little bit of a scratch when I'm polishing and I see the two layers coming together. If that happens, I just run a very fine uh, red diamond burr there, re-etch, and put flowable, and then polish the flowable. You're basically sealing, again, from the enamel to the composite. If you ever get that line coming back, or if it's five years later and they get a stain, that's how I usually take away the stain. I use a, a rounded, a fine diamond burr to get two pieces re 
uh, sort of re uh, prepared, use etch again, use Denton Bond, and use the, the flowable, and it really seals it nicely. But here we got a pretty good result uh, with that cervical. So those are some fine repairs. Let's go to maxillary anterior lateral, which actually I'm sorry, but I changed that to an anterior. Oh, that's the lateral. I'm sorry. That's the lateral. This is a small change. Patient wanted, uh, didn't, kind of couldn't afford the veneer, but she had this lower tooth hitting her lateral there. And you see how it's kind of, kind of rotated in and lingually, and you have a little bit of a step here. So we wanted to bring it out facially, but also get rid of that occlusion. So I want to change the environment. I'll go ahead and recontour the lower tooth just so it gets out of the way of the occlusion, make sure her guidance is okay, and then start uh, you know, interproximally cleaning her up and starting the preparation. So minimal preparation was done. We just see a little bit of the pearl frost here. So the pearl frost is like a, almost like a trans type of low value. As you see her teeth, if you analyze her you know, teeth, are very, very smooth with a lot of trans. The black background we put here so we can see the trans, how much it is, and that tells me to use a pearl frost. There's no real color in this. It's just adding to this whole facial. The margin's actually up here and goes down to there. Uh, but it gets the tooth out of occlusion. It brings it forward into the plane of the smile. If you go back, you see it was tucked in there. So we basically prepared it there all the way up to that spot and then added it uh, to the rest of it and just polished it up. So that's an easy fix, but really makes a difference for her smile. You can see here, I've adjusted the lower so it's not really hitting it. All the, the canine is hitting the canine. I'm trying to get it away from this uh, bonded area so she doesn't break it. Maxillary anterior lateral. This is the maxillary anterior canine. This is where I tell everybody to pull up a drink and relax and see if we can learn something. I want to answer one of your questions. With the step back, let me see if I can read the question. With the step back of color is one shade step back or two shades step two shades step back two shades step back. So if I'm going for a B1, I'm going to an A2 uh, layering. Do you always retract with cord for these cervical lesions? Not always, but if I need to, if there's tissue in the way, I need to retract, or I can use a um, Electrosurge I really like, very small, small, fine, di uh, like a pin tip to, uh, to do a little bit of a electrosurge around the tissue if, if I can't get uh, the bleeding to stop. Question is, how do you keep the retraction cord from being bonded to the tooth? I use a little Vaseline on it, so you dip it in the Vaseline. Uh, I think I had trouble retrieving the cord. So you want to put the, the retraction cord in with a little Vaseline, and then you don't want to pull it out facial. You want to pull it actually towards the lingual. So it slips around the, the composite. Put a little Vaseline on it and you'll get it out. What do I mean by step back two steps? What I mean is if I'm going for an anterior final shade of uh, B1, my, my first layer, my dentin first lingual layer will be uh, A. If I'm going for a B1, it'll be A2. So I'm stepping back two shades. So I'm, I'm sorry if I misconstrued that. I'm stepping back two shades from the shade that I want to achieve in the anterior. So my lingual base is going to be two shades darker than my anterior final shade. I hope that clears it up. Uh, let's move forward and we'll ask, uh, answer another question. So here's my, my tabs for this patient treatment. She sees she has a canine. It's a, it's a deciduous canine, right? So if we have a deciduous canine, we really can't put any occlusion on it. So I'm going to be very conscious of my occlusion um, about when I, when I restore this tooth. But let's take a look at uh, this patient. You see she's here in her occlusion. So I may want to choose to change this tooth a little bit if I need it to get back to aesthetics. So this is where originally they told us in dental school form follows function. If we want a beautiful anterior aesthetic canine, all right, and it's going to get in the way of the function, then we have to compromise. Either we're going to make this look short and not in the right place, or we need to recontra the lower. Now, I'm very open to my patients, and I say, listen, if you want a beautiful tooth, I have to recontra your lower tooth. And recontouring, I show them in the mirror how much I'm going to take away, how little it is, and how it's really not noticeable. But for the bite and for the occlusion and for the excursions, 
it's going to be very uh, it's very critical, especially on a on a deciduous tooth on a 35 year old female. Uh, we don't want to put any pressure at all on this tooth, otherwise we'll lose it. She's been holding on to it for these years because she had no occlusion on it and because it's not in excursions. So we don't want to add to it and then start another problem and possibly lose the tooth and possibly crack it. So we want to be really careful about this. So these are deciduous teeth. You've got to be a little bit diligent about making sure your occlusion. I'm going to go through the process of how I do the occlusion on it, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you what we do here. So here's another view of it. The premolar's not hitting, and the canine's not hitting in excursions. I would say this is more of an A1 shade or a B1 shade. If I look at my shade guides of my composites, it's going to look at about a B1. So if I'm doing a B1, I'm probably going to put my lingual as an A2. So my lingual is going to be all A2. I'm going to start with A1, and then I'm going to finish with a B1. So I'm going to do the two layers, uh, three layers of that uh, color. Here's my uh, B1, here's my A1, and my A2 is what I'm going to use for the base. So it's about a B1 compared to my composites that I'm using. Here's the uh, A2, it's a little bit darker. Okay, and that's what we look at from that view. So we go ahead and etch. Preparation is right here. Here's the preparation, a less semilunar preparation. Wrapping around the lingual, remember I want to get nice uh, structure on it. Every now and then, I just want to make a note of this, if I have a grinder, bruxer, extreme clencher, I may even go into the enamel here and make a U-shaped preparation just to hold the composite mechanically. In this case, I didn't have to, but I wrap around the facial and I wrap around on the lingual. We're doing our dentin bond and enamel bond, and now we put our matricizine. We put our A2 in the back and we start building up our A1, our B1. We finalize with our B1 and at the end I put a little bit of a uh, pearl frost, just a little bit of translucency right at the edge. Now I like to build up and I like to contour. So when I look at this, I did this on Monday just because it just came into the office I figured I would share it with you. I look at it and I like to make a nice beautiful you know, canine that looks natural and, and you know, it looks aesthetic and it's nice and pointy because it looks younger. When she goes into occlusion, she starts hitting it. So I, I have to keep taking it down. So I'm showing you how I'm re-sculpturing the aesthetics to follow the function. So you see, this is where I really wind up with the function. And then I go into excursions with her. So here's my three layers right there. So I'm not even polishing. I just want to get the occlusion down. Here's my occlusion in centric, so this is starting to hit, so that's not good. I've got to get rid of that contour, so I recontour a little bit of the lower premolar, and then I start recontouring a little bit of the canine. So this is her opening and closing, and then I ask her to go into guidance. When she goes into right working, she starts hitting the edge. So again, we can't have that. I start adjusting this, and I'm adjusting the upper. I'm adjusting both of them to start to get her into the original guidance that she had, which was here. The original guidance was the premolar to premolar, so I'm going to keep doing that and try to get her back to this guidance right here. I don't want any any touching here at all, so I'm, I'm still recontouring and adjusting, recontouring and adjusting until I get this to guide and this to be clear. Now, even this amount of space is still a little bit, you know, a little chancy. I'd rather have more like this, so I'll just take it down a little bit more and get that freedom. And then I'll go in with the mosquito and start cleaning up the interproximal. Start cleaning up the interproximal, start polishing it with my rubber wheels. Here's the lingual step. So we went all the way around to there. Again, this is polished to a butt joint at this point. It's polished to a butt joint all the way through. And we start with our, our Robinson brush and we finalize with our um, paste. We use paste on our slow speed with uh, basically a rag wheel made for a slow speed and that really gets me the, the best finish that I've ever been able to get and we get it to look like that. But the occlusion was really the key point in this uh, the canine treatment. The question is always, well if this was a natural canine with a long root, would you have put it into guidance? And that's a really good question. I probably would have still shared the, the, the two, either the premolar and the canine or the canine and the lateral. I would still share the two guidances. I don't think it's strong enough to hold a full guided patient with just composite. I think there's going to be a chip. So I'll share the load with the two teeth if I have to. And that's the final result there. 
We use the Optifine uh, polishing paste from Ivocar. Again, all of them I think are the same. I've tried all of them, but I don't think there's a difference in the polishing paste. As long as the, the filler of the, of the material is 50 microns, that's what I seem to be the right, uh, the right size. So before I go to the next one, let's answer some questions. Can you describe the compression? Uh, the compression is uh, using those um, cervical matrices and incisally putting the composite in and then squeezing them down. So you have the two matrices uh, on interproximal, and then you have the compression of the cervical matrix on the incisor. So you're pressing down the composite. And you can keep doing that as many layers as you want. So you're getting that compression on the incisor. But mostly that happens when we do the uh, cervical, and you'll see a couple of those in a minute. Uh, two shades on what can continuum by value. I don't know what that means, so please ask the question a little bit clearer. Won't the Vaseline on the cord affect the bonding? No, because the Vaseline is on the cord and it's beyond the margin. It should be beyond the margin. It should not be anywhere near the margin when, you can, when, you're, when you're retracting, so that shouldn't be an issue. Do you make your own tabs with composite that you have? Yes, I do. That's the whole thing, is to, is to get your composite, whatever you're using, so you have your own specific tabs. How do you determine the thickness of pearl frost? I think it's touch and feel. You've got to put a little bit of it. I think it's never more than a half a millimeter. It's always very, very slight. Uh, do you place all your composite shades down and then cure, or do you place the lingual layer down, cure, and then cure as you layer? I put the lingual layer down, cure, and then start with each layer, and I cure each layer. That's a good question. So let's continue on. Central incisor. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, I basically look at what's my favorite tooth. I really don't like the lateral. It's a little bit out. This central is a little bit in and it's short. So I think this is my favorite tooth. I'm going to copy that. Most of this is old composite bonding. So the first thing I do is get rid of all the stains. She's a little bit of a coffee and smoker uh, person. So I'm going to get rid of the stain and really find out what the real color is. And once you do that, you kind of start understanding how much you need to prepare. So I've tried to clean it up a little bit more, but it's, again, you still have a lot of uh, stains here. Uh, cervically, sometimes we need to change it, right? I want to make this cervical line about the same as this cervical line. So, you know, I, sometimes I'll take a little electrosurgeon and kind of change this if I need to. But this one's very, very slight. I could probably do it with a, a small little uh, laser. So you see here I'm preparing the whole facial of the tooth. I got rid of this decay. There's a little decay in there, so I kind of opened up the, the caries there. Uh, I opened up the caries here, cleaned it up. I'm basically just scratching the surface and making sure my gingival line and my margin line is going to be nice and clean at the gingival area. This is a serrated uh, saw blade. If I'm preparing, I don't want to scratch the other tooth, and I'll go ahead and place that in. So I'm being very careful. I'm using a green diamond pointed uh, to really uh, get a, the best uh, you know, margin that I can get. But I'm using this to protect the other tooth. So here, I'm going to go ahead and fill this up really quickly with a regular uh, you know, hybrid composite. But I have my preparation here. You see here, it's a little bit uh, a jagged at the end. That's her old composite. I want to get rid of all the old composite and get back to enamel. So after we've uh, prepared this one and we fix that one, we go ahead and start putting it. So here, what you see here is uh, the building of the linguals already done. With My final shade is going to be a... Two, I think. I think it's an A2 final shade. So I'll build up the back with an A3, A4, then start with an A2 and end up with a little bit of an A1. Remember, these A2 different shades, these are very difficult shades because you have different calcifications here. So you, sometimes you have to mix it up. So here I'll put a little bit of A2 and a little bit of A1 just to mix it up to get that little blending of composite because that's really the trick on one of these is if the blending of the of enamel is different and you have to blend the composite. You can't just use one monochromatic uh, composite. So here I'm adding a little bit of uh, pearl frost at the end just to get a little trans on it and building up this back up. Get it to this point. And now I start using my red and I start polishing in here, polishing in here. And you can see that little delineation here. So I, if I start seeing the colors too translucent, 
I re-prepare it, re-etch it, and then add a little color. Because if I don't get the color that I want, then I want to, and I see it has too much trans in there, I'll start changing it. So whenever you see things that are too trans, you just take them off and start over in that little area if you need to. So I'm polishing with the fine diamond. Polishing with the fine diamond. Then you see I added a different color here because I had too much trans. If you look at this area, it's too much trans here. So I cut it back and put a different layer of A1 instead of the, instead of the pearl frost that I had. Sometimes you've got to make those changes. You get to this point, and you can see the different colors that she has. I'm trying to mimic that. So she has a different shade here, a different shade here. She's got some yellow in there. So I'm trying to re kind of make that with the, with, with the pearl frost and the A1 combination. We uh, took care of this composite here, and we're just trying to polish it at this point. So that's the final one. I, she left for, uh, for the Cayman, so I never got a final shot of the healing up. But she left in this way, which is really happy. We in, increased the size of this. Now, what happens when I increase the size of of this? I have to reduce the lower. So again, the discussion is this lower is in the way to make your tooth look the same as the other tooth. I need to reduce it. So I'm changing the environment to make the aesthetics work. I can't just say your lower tooth is, you know, hitting it. I'm going to make it shorter. That's not going to be a good uh, result. So that's the final, the final shot that I got. I couldn't get a, a final, uh, more than that because she left. Let's answer some more questions. And that's the black and white. The black and white shows you the contour and the texture. So whenever I switch to black and white, I like to see the contour and the texture of it and see that I get it right. And that's a great thing about digital photography. You really get uh, a good sense of what you're doing uh, with the colors. Okay, let's get some questions. Do you still use dentin bond if prep is in enamel? Yes, because the dentin bond um, liquid is a very thin, it's a thinner liquid, so it'll, it'll permeate the enamel rods better than a 2FL or an unfilled resin. But yes, I still do that. When you place flowable around prep margins, do you cure or place composite over them, shape and cure? Flowable around the prep margin, do you cure and place the composite over and then shape? Yes, I put the flowable on, and I either use a matrix or I use some kind of compression on it. And if I want to put composite over them, then I put it all together, and then I cure, and then I shape. I hope that answers your question there. What's the thickness of the composite in your guides? Um, good question. I'm not measuring it, but if I did, I would say it's about a millimeter and a half, 1.5. I think that's a good number to measure to see if you have translucency. But that's a good idea. I'm going to go back and measure those. Is your middle shade a dentin shade or a body shade? Good question. It has to do with your composite. So if you're buying composite from a company like Kerr, and they have specific dentin shades and body shades, then you have to make that decision for yourself. Uh, the, the composites that I'm buying from Ultradent have a shade. They don't have dentin shades or body shades, so I'm just using a shade. Um, I call it a dentin shade because it's part of the dentin part of the tooth. So I'm calling it a dentin shade, but my shade is either B1, trans, pearl frost, uh, A2, A4, A3, whatever. So it's not a specific dentin shade from my system, but if your system has that, then you need to play with that to get to figure out uh, the right color for yourself. Pearl fro what is pearl frost? It's just a shade name from their ultra dent uh, amylogenesis uh, amylogenesis uh, composite. It's just a name that they use. It's a very light translucency with a little bit of color. How long does this take? Approximate fees for aesthetic procedures. We charge about 325 in Manhattan per surface. So if it's two surfaces, it's three surface or four surface, uh, we just have a surface fee. So you've got to figure out in your area what's a good surface fee. And then I think you can say to the front desk, two surface, three surface, or four surface, depending on the time it takes. Uh, but I would say the anterior single unit probably takes me about 45 minutes. Those other repairs took me about 30 minutes. Um, if I'm doing four units, I'll leave myself about two hours just to be relaxed. I don't have to rush. What kind of post-op instruction do you give the patient? Good question. Um, flossing every day. Uh, call us if there's a bite issue. Um, if the shade changes, please call us. Uh, you're guaranteed up to two years. We'll, we'll change the shade and we'll fix the, the bonding. We'll, you know, we'll pair it up to two years. 
Uh, if it's a grinding patient and I tell them they have six months, if it breaks, they really need to get veneers. So we'll do that kind of uh, uh, disclosure. But post-op instructions, just, just brush you normally, take, get a very uh, uh, toothpaste that has non-abrasive uh, uh, particles. A lot of the whitening toothpaste patients use, I tell them don't use that because it'll, it'll erode the, the composite, uh, but pretty much things like that, nothing too specific. Uh, this is uh, Thomas. Thomas uh, had a little uh, accident with his, um, with his jet ski and uh, the parents called me up. He's about 19 years old. So I said to them, uh, you know, they asked me, should I do veneer, should I do a crown? And obviously the first thing was to get the root canal done and the endodontics completed. Once that was completed, uh, they came right away because they wanted to fix the tooth. So the protocol here is a little bit different than the textbook, so I use a different protocol. My protocol is I wait three weeks before I put any kind of post, and I do use post for every root canal. And I know that's not uh, common around the country, but I feel if, if there's gutta percha in there, it's a lot weaker than a steel post. So we put steel posts in every tooth that's a root canal tooth, no matter what, because I want to have that strength for any future accidents. But our protocol is three weeks after endodontics, the, root, the post goes in, but obviously he can't wait three weeks because he's working around without a tooth. So we wanted to get him in to get some kind of bonding material. We're eventually going to do a crown. But just to show you how, even if you didn't do a crown or the patient couldn't afford it, uh, bonding and composite bonding really works, especially on a good occlusal patient. With these, he happens to be a very good occlusal patient. He's got good guidance and good centric position. So I'm not worried about his occlusion. Uh, long term. So you see the root canal and endodontics was completed. This is lower arch. He had obviously braces. Everything's nicely aligned. So I'm not really worried about centric position. I'll check my centric on all my canines and my and my uh, premolars, and I'll check the canines for guidance. And he's got him pretty nicely on his number eight. So everything's in place, an ideal situation. If you're dealing with a clencher in this situation, where an older patient, uh, you know, that has a lot of clenching, it's a different story. But in this particular predicament, we need to just get him a tooth quickly. So what I'm going to do is isolate the tooth, get some uh, uh, clearance from it, and I'm going to prepare my semilunar area here on the, uh, on the facial. And on the lingual, I'm going to go ahead and go about three to four millimeters deep. I'm not going to take out all this gutta percha. I just want to get a temporary bond frame, but I will do a full edge. I will do a full edge here. And we'll use the Luxacor as our base. And that has usually a shade of A3. So you can see from this photo, he's about an A2 bordering on A3, A2 with a little bit of A1 uh, cervical li uh, lines here at the incisal. So he's a multi-shade A3, A2, A1. So if I see that, I know I'm going to put my base in, and that's my Luxacor. So I'm going to prepare a little bit here, bring up the Luxacor, etch this whole thing, dent and bond the whole thing. And then here's my dentin bond after I etch, and we're going to put Luxacor in there, even though I'm going to take it out in three weeks. So here's my Luxacor base. Now, again, you can use a matrix for the back of this. Or you can use your finger. You can use a clear matrix, whatever you need to do to support this. So it's inside the canal, and it's in the lingual part here. After this cures, we release it from the interproximals with a little uh, blade. And I go ahead and scratch it up. And here comes your first question. What is the material that we use to uh, build this up with? So that's your first question. Uh, we go ahead and separate this. And we'll do interproximal uh, separation. And now we start with our 2FL and our 1FL. And we'll start with an uh, A2. Then we'll go to A1 and just finish up up here with an A1. But pretty much the body is going to be A2 which is going to bring it up a little lighter. Now, what did I do to this tooth? You saw it before, it was darker. Well, I, I said to myself, if I'm going to change these teeth, let's do a little bit of, of polish. So what I did was I polished it with a carbide, then I did a little spot etch, and then I polished it again. So it brings up a little bit of the color. By doing spot etch on these, sometimes the enamel gets a little lighter. And then you polish it back to a nice luster. So I've changed this color from an A3, A2, A1 to basically an A2 or an A1, like a combination. So I'll start with my A1. Again, because he's got a blend. Now, another point to remember, when you're working on this tooth for a half an hour, it gets desiccated, right? It gets very dry. 
So this color is different than the color you're going to wind up with. And that gets very tricky. Those are the most frustrating things is when you fix the color and you match it, they come back later and this is lighter than this tooth or this is darker than this tooth. So constantly wetting these teeth is really important. Don't let them dry out too much. So we're building up. You see a different little color here of A1 and A2 here. A little bit of flowable on the outside to really get some compression. So that's the A2 and that's the A1. And remember, those are going to come lighter. The A2 is going to turn into A1, and the A1 is going to turn into a B1. So they're always going to turn a little bit lighter than what we want. And here's a little bit of the pearl frost, which brings out the trans and a little bit of brightness in it. But you see I'm overbuilding, and I'm going to contour down. So I start contouring with my, uh, my red diamond. We use the, uh, the, the uh, let me go back to that, sorry. We use our carbides, carbides, and then the lingual uh, uh, carbides as well to get the new good contour on the lingual. Now, if you notice, he's got some striations here. And you can kind of, I mean, if you want to get crazy, you can go ahead and read, you know, this is not his final tooth. Remember, we're making a crown here. But if I really wanted to match this, the way to match these little hypercalcifications is to take your burr, cut, 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 and then layer in a whiter composite and get that calcification. So if you want to recreate that in a final restoration, you got to cut back the, the, the composite and then relayer it. Here's my Soflex this. Now if you look at the tooth here proportionally, and I think it's important to look at the view from this view. That's why I took the photo from this view. When you look at the, the teeth from the back, it gives you a better perspective. You can see that this tooth is thinner than this tooth I created. So I have to recontour this to make sure I get that, that good width that he has. So I always like overbuilding and then recontouring back. That's the soap flex disc. I'm getting the edges correct, corrected. And now I can use the, the red diamond lingually and facially. And this gives you some good lines. You see I'm creating some mamelons here. And you can see the different colors that I put in here just to kind of mask it so it's not one mono shade. And I get the incisor position. So once I get this position, now I start playing with my occlusion. If you can see here, he actually broke his lower, uh, uh, his lower incisor when he got into the accident. And I didn't see that until I started looking at the photo. So I'm going to go back and uh, repair that for him. But if you look at as he goes out into extrusions, into protrusive, he starts hitting it. So I'm adjusting the lower, I'm adjusting the upper, I'm adjusting the lower, I'm adjusting the upper. So now his natural tooth hits his natural tooth. I'm good with that. Natural tooth hitting here, I'm good with that. So he's going here. I keep adjusting. I'm adjusting the upper, adjusting the lower. And now I start polishing with the white wheel. This is a, a luminous oxide diolite wheel. We have white, pink, and then the Robinson brush. I got the, the, the contour to be a little bit better here. You can see it. And we got the proportion. And now I'm ready to do my final finishing. Here's the interproximals I use. I do not use the red or the blue. I only use the yellow, right in between, right in between. The yellow, fine uh, interproximal um, separators. So we see our final restoration here. You can see the crack lines here and the craze lines here as well from the accident. We basically uh, polished it up and now we're ready to shine it up. And you can see the different colors that are matching here. I don't think this is an ideal situation, but again, this is our... Um, our, uh, our temporary, so to speak. It's our provisional. And here's our bonding technique. You see the, here the crate lines. So for, for a quick fix, I think he was uh, very happy. You know, if I wanted to do a final and get a little crazy, I would definitely use some more colors in between here if I was going to be my final restoration. Check his occlusion again. And here's a good, uh, you know, trick to really remember that in occlusion, their centric position is always when they go back. They go back into centric and then they come forward. But we have to always check them outside of their parameters. You never know what they're doing when they're outside of their parameters. So I'm constantly checking right lateral and left lateral. And that basically means right over here. When they're all the way out to the left, right there. And see if there's any contact when they go back and forth from that position. It's not just protrusive to the edge. It's protrusive all the way out. You follow that? So when they're moving all the way out, sometimes the canine hits, right? So we want to look at all the possible mo motions of the protrusive, not just at the edge, but further out. So I'm constantly looking at that. 
that's the final result. Again, from a different vantage point now, you start seeing the blend actually work for him. And they were very happy uh, with that final result. As a temporary, it's not so bad. Smile line here. And a little luster, and then you can see the position of it. So we, again, whatever we, when we go back to uh, polishing these, we always go back, when we do adjustments, we go back and polish, make sure that the enamel's remineralized. So there's his uh, provisional, so to speak, for three or four weeks. Okay, let's answer some questions. Do you use 40 by Bisco, 4 to 5 by Bisco or some other varnish on composites? Um, varnish I use, not 4 to 5 by Bisco. I heard it's good, though. On a central incisor, it looks like you left serrated saw blades in when bonding. How do you achieve contact interproximally? The serrated, serrated uh, blades are really about, uh, hmm, I would say they're about 200 microns. So, I mean, it's about, about the same size as your average matrix. So, I mean, I don't think it's a problem with the contact point. Uh, what non-abrasive toothpaste do you recommend? Uh, there's one that from, uh, it's called Natural Dentist. It's all natural. There's no uh, silica in it. There's no uh, abrasive. There's no SLS, which is a really bad material for toothpaste. So that's what we recommend, natural dentist toothpaste. Are you always using self-etching primer? The answer is yes. Do you ever use phosphoric acid and enamel only? Uh, do I ever use phosphoric acid on enamel only? Yes. Yes, sometimes we do. What kind of clear matrix are you using? It looks softer than the standard clear mylar matrix. Oh, it's the same one. It's just a, a thinner type, a little bit more flexible. Are you ultimately going to crown that central? Yes. The root canal? Yes. We're going to ultimately crown it. If so, are you using all ceramic crown? And wouldn't a fiber post be better? Well, if you take a fiber post in your hand and you try to break it, it breaks. Right? So I don't use fiber carbon because it breaks in your hands. If you use a steel post, you can't break it. So I want something strong. Uh, I'm not worried about the color. I'm going to block that out. Uh, a lot of people talk about fiber carbon. I don't use it. I don't use it because I, I want something that's not going to break. What makes the model of your DSLR? Um, I don't know. What, what do you mean by DSLR? I don't know what you mean by that. So please describe that. Don't you worry about the flexural issues of steel posts versus carbon fiber posts. I don't want to get into that. It's, I, can, I can give you 15 articles that talk about posts. And I can give you 20 articles that talk about non-posts. So that's a different issue, not for today. And it's personal preference. Please don't judge me on it. You always want to ensure that there is no context on the restored areas. Yes, I don't want contact on my restored areas incisally. incisally. What were your interproximal burrs used in yellow? Um, we'll describe that uh, privately. Please email me. Why do you not use a matrix band instead of serrated ones? I use both. What type of composite do you re-add decalcification flowable? Uh, it's, a whiter, it's a white composite, basically white. Good questions. Thank you for your questions. I'll keep going. Uh, here we have multiple carries patient. Uh, so this is multiple units we're doing here. This is where we, I use the rubber dam. When I'm doing multiple units is when I put the rubber dam on, and we have a lot of decay to get to, get to here. So uh, we'll go ahead and make sure his guidance. I'm checking his guidance to see where I'm at. You can see he's a lot of wear on his anteriors here, so I'm really worried about this. He's got some cervical erosions here. All right, guidance here. I'm looking at the guidance here. He's on his premolar. I want to get rid of that. I want to stay on the canine here. I want to get rid of any other contacts posteriorly. Here's the, uh, this tooth needed endodontic treatment. This tooth is going to be okay, but we kind of did them all in the same session. Uh, this tooth, again, needed endodontic treatment. I wasn't going to treat that. We're just talking about the anterior. Uh, units right here, right now. So we'll go ahead and uh, take care of the posteriors first. For cervical reasons, uh, lesions, we'll go ahead and prepare it and get as much as decay as we can out. It's usually further than you think, so I over-aggressively prepare these because there's more decay than you think. You can see on the lower right, lower left. So a lot of preparation interproximal. Make sure you get all that decay out and clean it out. Here's the cervical matrix. In this case, I did not use a retraction core. The tissue was very clean. I used the cervical matrix, acid etch, dentin bond, 2FL, composite restoration, and then just squeeze it into position, cure it twice, and then start polishing. So it's a really great way to get a good contour on the cervical erosion cases. And here's the other side. We do one at a time. 
same thing with the other one. So that that's really uh, a great you know technique to use is those cervical matrices just to get rid of that decay. Here's your question number two. It's coming up now. And then we'll go ahead in the anterior as well. Isolate it. Right, you should be seeing a poll on your screen. What did we use to get compression? The, to get compression, the caries on the cervical areas. Please enter your answer. And yeah, we'll leave it open for a few more minutes. A lot of you still need to answer. Should I keep going? Um, not yet. We only have we have about uh, half that voted. So oh, okay. But ninety nine percent of them got it right. They better. <laughs> I made it easy for them. <laughs> okay, and we'll leave it up for two more seconds. Yep, 97% of them chose the correct answer, so we will close right. that now. And you're on. Okay, so we basically just, you know, regular decay. I like using round burrs, round diamonds for this, just get out the decay. Uh, here's the left side. Uh, now, these calcification, interesting part. Uh, when I talk to my materials uh, people at NYU, they feel when there's etchant on the calcified areas, it's not the same etchant enamel rods on calcified enamel. So I try to go a little bit further beyond to get a better enamel bond because the calcified enamel is not the same, and some of you may have known this who have been practicing for a long time. There's always a leakage after you do these because the actual enamel has not been etched. So calcified, hypercalcified enamel needs to be cut back to when you get to the final good enamel. So just pay attention to that when you're doing these hypercalcified uh, patients and make sure you get a good uh, clean uh, preparation away from the calcified enamel. So that's isolated. Here's the anterior. So once we finish the posteriors, I mean the laterals and canines, we go ahead and we try to re recreate the, mam the mammalons that, that he had in the original teeth. So we'll go ahead and, and uh, prepare this facially and again lingually. So we're wrapping around the whole tooth with that bonding. We're not just adding the edge. That gives it a lot more strength and a lot more uh, compression. So here's the dentin bond. And here's again, so what you see here, I don't have the matrix, but I put a matrix here and I, 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 I compressed it against the tooth. And then I cured it, then I took it off. So I have compression of the composite and building up your, my final shade is going to be uh, A1B1, so my, my dentin shade, my back shade, my base shade is going to be A2. And here you see the, 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 the interproximal carriage. You see this area here that I've added, this whole length of that tooth. Uh, much longer than what he originally had. You can actually see the translucency of the pearl frost coming through. So I blended pearl frost A1 and A2 to get that length that I wanted, and then I start working on the occlusion. So working on the occlusion, we polished it up, making sure that they're uh, nicely uh, polished and the occlusion's working. So again, I recontoured these to get that nice flow and make sure the guidance is working on them. Here's a black and white for the texture, and you can see it's all kind of matching. We're a little bit, I would say, a little bit too much translucent here, but still, overall, uh, a pretty good result for that kind of uh, for that kind of tooth. So that's his before, and that's his after. So we've increased it about millimeter to two millimeters. Maxillary anterior units. Let's talk about a little bit about this. I know it's boring, but just interestingly enough, remember you remember Tome's process from the enamel and the enamel rods and striae red CS. These are all these little things that we learned in, in first year dental school and hydroxyapatite of the enamel. So it makes a difference when you're doing an addition and how you're cutting. So when I'm looking at uh, the preparation design, especially we're doing around the tooth, right? We're trying to close the space. This patient wants to close the space. So this is a case in patient treatment that if I'm doing the four teeth, I got to get it perfectly right. So we can't do this in freehand. So I take this patient, I do a full wax up. The patient pays a little bit for that. So I get a full contra wax up. We take the wax up, we duplicate it into a, a stone model, and then we slowly use that as a matrix. So it's a, a wax up, a stone model, then a suck down Omnivac to get a nice perfect uh, position. But the key to this case is the enamel rods and the preparation. So here's the preparation. 
incisal view of these teeth, the incisal view of the centrals, the preparation cannot be just on the facial. It has to wrap around the lingual. So I take care of the occlusion first. I reduce these and give me the freedom that I need. Then the preparation, remember the final result has got to come back from the lingual. If this is the facial, this is the facial, this is the lingual, the preparation starts from the lingual and comes out. We don't want to just add to the facial and have a, a, a deline delineation of the back of the tooth. So it really comes from the lingual all the way around to the facial. And we're doing full facial contour here, so we're doing full facial veneers with composite. But we have to do a wax up for that. You can't do that freehand. So that's the way we want it to look. We want the composite to end here. And this margin is more like a butt joint than this margin. Even though this is the whole tooth, this margin's got to be more of a butt joint to really end it cleanly and you can polish it. So here's my final preparation. You see I've done this. I've done a little bit of surgical uh, with, the, with the electro surge. Look at my preparation on the lateral. It's all the way behind, right? I don't want to show any enamel forward. Uh, it's back within the lingual part of the tooth. It's almost broken open the contact because we want to bring that, that composite all the way to the finishing line and not have this delineation of enamel to composite. We want to bring it all lingual. Same thing here, all the way in the lingual, all the way in the lingual wrapped around. This way the whole tooth is in a composite contact. It's a lot easier for you to clean too. If we finish these interproximal, you may get caries down the road. If they're back on the lingual, you can visually see the margin and then clean it. So it's a different type of preparation and it's just more towards the lingual and it's easier to polish and easier to fix. So you see that's the real preparation. Now we basically use our, our OmniVac with our composite and our Benton bonding techniques and we put the whole thing in position, one tooth at a time, and uh, we start contouring and we get a result like this. So then I'll do my little contouring from the back, the matrix, matrix with the wax up form, and I'll do all my recontouring, all my polishing, and then when I showed it to her, she goes, well, I kind of think I want a little bit of space that I had. So we went in with a disc. And we opened up, uh, you see the, the lateral view of this, we opened up her central, so she got a little bit of her space back, and she was happier than having it closed. So we kind of just opened it for her with a diamond disc, and got it to that point. And when she smiles, she's really got a nice look for her interproximal. That was two weeks later. So, you know, she got what she wanted, and we achieved a pretty good start. But these results have to be done with a wax-up. You really can't do it uh, without the wax-up. Let's look at some questions. Um, is it okay that I'm answering the questions or do you want me to type them up? I'll take that as an okay. Are cervical matrix the same size? No, they have different sizes. Do you use the inverted cone to prepare mechanical retention, the class five restoration? Uh, I don't use that. That was in dental school. We use round burrs slow speed or high speed, mostly slow speed, to get rid of the decay. So we don't use inverted cones anymore. Use the round burr. It's an easier uh, way to, re to retain that composite. Uh, next question. I can't see. Oh, here it is. When vertically compressing composites with matrix, do you not lose the oxygen inhibiting layer to bond to? I don't know what that means. How do you determine the shade of the main bulk of the composite? By looking at my shade tabs as I, uh, as I, before I start. Do you layer right over the composites that you have compressed? Yes. Do you remove the outer surface and redo the bonding agents? No. You just have to put a little 2FL, which is an unfilled resin. That's a good question. So when we're adding composites, we don't have to re-etch or, or start over, but we do put a little bit of a, a 2FL between them so it bonds the here is a little bit better. How much of the opposing can you reduce as much as you need to? It really is much as you need to, and it's usually minor. It's not that much. How do you use the suck down? It's the, the, we use the wax up. We duplicate the wax up in uh, stone, and then we use the, the OmniVac. Did you do all one shade for those composite veneers? No, we put two shades. We put a, an A2 here and an A1 here. That's a good question. Sorry I didn't say that. Um, Do you have pictures using vacuum suck down? Uh, no, I'm sorry I don't have those with me. 
but I can email you that. If you email me, I'll email you a photo of that. It's basically the OmniVac of the wax up, and then you're just you know, sucking it down onto the, onto the stone. Last I asked in the case, you couldn't do the layering technique. Yeah, you can do it. You can just layer inside the OmniVac. That's the great thing about OmniVac. You can put three or four layers in and just compress it. You get great compression. And you get great uh, closure of all your margins. So it's a really good technique. Do you fill the entire composite with a bulk cure? Do you layer the matrix? You can layer it first. You can do, remember, with composite is one of the wonderful things about composite. You can make up your own technique, right? You can see what feels right. You can put your base first, and then with the, with the OmniVac, you can put your base first, then layer each tooth individually. You can put a whole bunch of composite and put the whole thing all together. You got you to figure out what you're trying to achieve. I'm trying to achieve a very easy kind of, you know, one maybe monochromatic color. She doesn't have too many colors here, so it's an, a, an A2 and an A1. So in this case, I, I did the laterals first and then I did the centrals together. Uh, you, can, you don't have to limit yourself and don't think there's one way better than the other. You have to play with it. You've got to feel comfortable that you can always take it away and add, take it away and add. So feel comfortable to really uh, play with it and, and you know, use your own imagination. It's really that kind of material that you can add and take away. Diagnostic uh, mock-up. I love the flowable composites. So for me, this is just really quick, right? The first thing I'm going to do is uh, analyze the color. He's an A2. He wants super white teeth. He's a businessman. He's wore his teeth down. I do some probing. What am I probing for? If I'm probing three millimeters, I can laser surgery too. If I'm probing one millimeter, then I need crown lengthening. So I do a quick probe. You see here, I'm three millimeters down. I can do any kind of recontouring of his tissue. But I'm just trying to do a mock-up, so I just need to know what I can get away with. I start with the flowables, and I start adding the flowables. He wants to keep a little bit of diastema, so I start with the flowables, and then I just start recontouring. This is all freehand. And we teach this at our course. We do a lot of hands-on provisionals, something none of us were taught in dental school. Uh, hands-on provisional is a wonderful technique to learn to get yourself with your mind and your eye and your hands to a wonderful position where you can start really creating smiles. Uh, you know, that's something you need to learn. It's something you need to, sh to watch how it's done to really learn it. So we use flowable composite just with hand uh, carving, and then I start carving, carving it. I do my laterals, my canines. So I basically, he wants a little gap. Remember, the gap that they see is this. You can always keep it connected here. You don't have to go through the gap all the way through just to kind of show them. This is layered exactly on the tooth, it's, I mean on the tissue. So this is just laid on the tissue. Later, if I go back and do the veneers and the crowns, I can go back and just cut this laser back because I probed it. Once you probe three millimeters, you know you can take away one. Your biologic width needs to be two, two and a half. So anything past two and a half, you can go ahead and laser away from it. So he looks pretty good now, right? He can see it visually. You can take the photos and show it to him. And now he's going to say, okay, I like what I see. You know, now I think I want to go ahead forward. So using the flowable composites, I think it's a great technique. Uh, to show mock-ups for patients. And now we're going to finalize our, our presentation with a maxillary anterior implants. Now, for those of you who haven't done implants in the anterior, it's very challenging, but I'm going to just show you a couple little techniques that really work for the implant restoration and the provisional. So if you're thinking about putting an anterior implant in and want to make the patient a tooth in the same day, the three major rules are there's got to be a buccal plate. So in this patient, there has to be a buccal plate before we extract this tooth and put the implant. With no buccal plate, we can't do immediate. That's rule number one. Rule number two is that there's no occlusion on the provisional. And rule number three is you have a good internal connection that you can screw into and that your screw is not going to get loose because you can't get it out after the implants. And you've got to wait at least three months before you touch it. So here's a, we're using digital design. So if you guys, young dentists out there, if you're doing scanning stuff and with, with scanners, this is a trio scan of the tooth. We're making a provisional with the laboratory, so he's fabricating us a provisional based on the, the CT scan and based on the scan of the original tooth. Once we get that in position, the, 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 the surgeon takes out the tooth, places the implant, and you see here the implant, so the patient comes right to our office. Look at the delineation of where the tooth used to be. Right? So just remember that, that shape. What we're doing with our technique is we're using that provisional, we're putting on a, uh, a temporary abutment, we're contouring it down so it's out of occlusion, we're opening up and we're hollowing this little hole here, we're using this, this is a, a provisional made out of a PMMA material, 
It's made by the laboratory. It costs like $45. It's very inexpensive. It's basically an ion crown, but the exact shape of the patient's tooth. So think about having the exact shape of the patient that they had as an ion crown and a prefab crown. So we're using our flowable composite to create that gingival architecture. We're polishing it. We're in the mouth now. You see we hollowed it out. And we're going to flow in our composite in there and lock it into position with light cure material. So this is a, a technique that basically uh, using provisionals and the composite materials, we can get a really nice look on it. So here, around the contour of the actual uh, implant abutment, we're using our flowables. We're flowing up everything here, and we're contouring it. We're polishing it. We're making sure it's fitting really nicely. And when we screw it into position, guess what? The exact shape that was the original tooth that she got extracted is now copied. The way it's done, it's done from the laboratory perspective. They get a CT scan of the, of the surgical area, of the surgical guide, and then they get the scan that we've done intraorally. So they're basically mimicking exactly the tooth that she had, and we're just changing the shape of it at the cervical level by using our flowable composite. Close up the access hole. And this is question number three. So I'll give you a couple minutes for question number three. Okay. Question three is up. Which composite was used to fill in cervical area of the implant restoration? All right. Um, about half of you have voted, so leave it up for a little bit more. Okay, about all of you voted, 95% got it right. I want to know who's getting it wrong. I could let you know. <laughs> I'll send you a list later. Okay. <laughs> and you're back on, so. Okay, so a couple of questions, let's answer it. Can you explain if you remove the facial of the suck down matrix that you use, is it the same as a PVS matrix? It's not the same as the PVS matrix. The PVS matrix you can't see. So when you lock that in, it's also flyable. So you may not get a really good a, a compression of the composite. Uh, the OmniVac is clear. Okay, It's an OmniVac O2O material. It's clear. And because it's clear, you can see the composite. You can see if there's any voids. You can take it off, put it back on. So we use that much better than PVS material. We do use the PVS material when we're doing our Luxatemp veneers. So we'll use our PVS material for luxatent veneers, not for composite bonding. Good question. Does the matrix bond the teeth together? Does the matrix bond the teeth together? You mean, they're, I'm, I'm assuming you mean the four teeth are bonded together. Yes, they're bonded together. I split them up if I'm doing all four at once, and then I just do the interproximal contacts. So if I have to do it that way, I can do it that way. A lot of questions. Thank you. What material thickness do you use for clear matrix? O2O, 0 0.020. When you use a matrix for the OmniVac, how do you prevent the composite from binding between the teeth? It doesn't. It binds between the teeth, then I separate the teeth, and then I just use my little matrix to, to create a new contact. So you're, you're going fast on the four teeth, but you're going a little slower when you're doing the interproximal contacts. Every technique has its pros and cons. Remember, nothing's up uh, easy and perfect. There's always going to be some trick to each technique. How do you handle interproximal with OmniVac? So we're getting that question a lot. Are the interproximal flossible or does it get bonded? Same question. Since you don't use the inverted cone on the class fives, you try to put some mechanical retention with your router. Yes, of course. Always mechanical retention when you can get it. Using the suck down measure, how do you separate the teeth? So we answered that question. Did you use any bonding agent with the flowable mock-up? Uh, yes, a little 2FL gets the adhesion of the flowable to that. Are you bonding those flowable mock-ups? Yes. Not etching, not etching, no etching. How do you remove the temp later? Oh, you mean on the, I'm assuming he means the central, I think. Um, please ask the question, be more specific on which case, because I don't want to answer incorrectly. Um, with your anterior veneer suck down matrix, how are you achieving proximal separation? Everybody asked the question. I'm sorry I didn't cover it. Again, we're, we're putting them all in together, and then we're separating them and then just adding the contacts afterwards. 
sorry that I wasn't clear on it. Um, OM implant, I don't know what that means. How do you remove the temp later from that implant? It's screw retained. So I'm going to go back a second just to show you. It's screw retained. There's, a, there's a Teflon in here. We're putting Teflon, which is you can get it at the drugstore. It's a thin Teflon uh, matrix that you can put down there. And then we close it up with the flowable, as you can see here. And then you're basically uh, drilling this out, getting back to this access hole. That's why I suggest always taking the photographs and uh, making sure you get back to your access hole. The great thing about this technique is sometimes your implant will come out on the facial. So the great thing about these flowables, you can actually close it from the facial and it'll really mask it really well with the composite. So it doesn't matter where your access hole is. You just got to go back in and access that um, when you're ready to go. So the great thing that happens here is extraction, placement, bone graft, provisional, out of occlusion. Here's your provisional. Here it is the next day. It's 24 hours later. This is where this is her Facebook picture before. This is her Facebook picture uh, two hours after. So you can see she's really happy about the, having that provisional. But it has to be those three components. Please don't forget those three criteria. Buckle plate has to be in place. Um, has to be out of occlusion in centric position, which means it may be a little shorter. And you need an internal connection to uh, to get it to stay. So you can see it's a little bit shorter than her other tooth. All right, we're just giving her a tooth, but the, the big technique that we're using here, we're publishing this uh, in, uh, coming out in JPD in about three months, that the technique here is that we're capturing that gingival architecture the way it was before she had the tooth extracted. And that's the real difference. We're capturing it digitally, which gives us down to a 60 micron uh, accuracy. You're going to see this paper published uh, next three months. This is seven days later. And that's uh, 30 days later, see the tissue responding there. And that's four months later when we did our final result. That's the, that's the provisional four months later. That's, you still see the provisional there, the, the tissue's healed really nicely. And that's the final crown that we uh, combined. So these composites really work well uh, finalizing uh, the patient's aesthetics uh, to be able to get it to where we want. So we've covered the mandibular incisors, composite repairs. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Uh, I'm going to take some more questions now as we wind down. Uh, let's see, how do you determine the shade of the main bulk of the composite? Um, as I said earlier in the beginning, we're using our shade tabs uh, from the materials that we start with, with the photographs and the materials that we have in your office. Just make your own shade tabs and try to figure out the color that the patient is and then choose one shade uh, lower in value to get uh, the final shade. For the implant provisional case, why use Teflon rather than cotton pellet inside the implant screw access hole? Well, if you know anything about leakage and, and water, uh, the, the Teflon resists water. It's basically plumber's tape. And the water, if you pr compress it down with a ball burnisher, you can get some really good closure. If you use the cotton pellet, there's always going to be leakage coming from the inside of the implant. Uh, as much as we want to think that when we screw things down, they're hermetically sealed, they actually are not. And if you've ever taken off an uh, implant screw from a, a crown, you have a very, very bad odor. Uh, by using the Teflon, we're actually uh, sealing that, really sealing it, so no odor and no water gets through that screw. And you'll reduce the odor and you reduce any infection or any kind of bacteria that's around the area. So that's why we use Teflon. Also, the cotton pellets get very dirty and hold a lot of uh, bacteria. The Teflon is hermetically sealed. Um, by Buccaneer's plate, do you mean? Oh, I think you meant the buckle plate, the buckle anterior bone plate, the buckle plate. Uh, when you probe an anterior tooth, if it's a, an infected tooth and it's going to be extracted, we probe the buckle plate. Uh, to make sure that it's there. If it's not there, we cannot do an immediate restoration. So that's one of the rules. The buckle plate of bone. Do you etch the bond before you use the Omnivac? Yes. 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 Sorry, I didn't mention that. We definitely etch it. 
what type of crown. The final crown was all ceramic. Uh, the final abutment was uh, zirconia with pink tissue. Uh, but the final crown, we always like to use felspathic in the interiors. Buckle plate intact, do you mean buckle bone? Same thing. Same thing, buckle plate and buckle bone. Whose are the three beautiful women? Your staff. Uh, no, they are models, and they, we were, they were hired to do the, our website, but they are patients. What's the make and model of your camera? I have the Canon uh, 70D SLR. Um, go to, I would probably tell you to go to, um, uh, uh, the name of the, it's H&R in Manhattan, uh, H&R cameras or uh, Dental Pro cameras has a great camera, but they're all about the same. They're about two thousand dollars. Can the Buccaneers plate? It's the buckle plate have fenestration, and will you only know this form from the scan? Correct. So every case is scanned. Uh, you only know if there's a buckle plate from the scan. If there's a fenestration in the in the scan, if it's way up in the by the root, you can still do an immediate restoration. If it's around the middle of the tooth, it may not be an immediate restoration. So your surgeon or yourself, if you're doing the surgery, needs to evaluate that, but only with a scan. You can't do it without a scan. Have you tried Firmit and Teflon tape? Firmit, again, is very soft. It leaks, it smells, and it's not a really good uh, system. Um, I think that's it. Any other questions? I'll wait another couple of minutes. I hope you enjoyed it. My email is drdean17 at AOL for any continuing uh, education or if you want to come to the office or if you want to spend a day at NYU, just let me know. I'm happy to uh, help my colleagues around the country. Uh, Dr. Dean, we have a few more questions. One is, uh, do you scan if it's an emergency extraction? If it's an, I, I usually don't extract the tooth myself. So if a patient in a lot of pain, they need an extraction, I usually decarbonate the tooth. I decarbonate the tooth and I use a provisional on top of that and I send it to the surgeon for extraction. My philosophy is I don't take out a tooth unless we're grafting. It's one of our real, real strong philosophies. We don't want to take out a tooth unless we're, we're, we're grafting that day, especially if it's an, I'm talking about an anterior aesthetic case. If it's a posterior tooth that doesn't have nothing to do with aesthetics, then you can take out the tooth. But anything anterior, we will not take out the tooth unless it's grafted. And one last one. Can you elaborate on how you open the contacts and then close again? So let's picture that the Omnivac is seated with four units. I take a diamond disc that's very, very thin. It's about 100 microns thick. And I place it, and I first make my actual interproximal so I can see aesthetically where they want to be. And then I cut right through. I polish with my mosquito on the interproximals. Then I use a matrix, and I close up the contacts as if it was just the a space case. But this way you get compression of the composite. That's the key thing. Making a contact is a lot easier than losing compression or getting a margin leaking. So I find that compression is one of the best techniques we have to really close the margins and really get a seal on it. The interproximal contact is going to take you, you know, another 10, 15 minutes to make. Uh, but And plus the matrix gives you the best interproximals anyway. So that's how we do it with a, with a, a thin diamond disc, which is about 10 mil 10 centim it's one centimeter, 10 millimeters thick. So it's really meaning wide, and it's only 100 microns thick. Okay, there's a couple more. Um, if a patient is in pain but you won't extract the tooth, you said you will decoronate it. Do you also do a pulpal debridement as part of this procedure? Yes, if, yes. If the tooth not, if the tooth is vital, yeah, we want to get the pulp out. I don't do root canal, but just get the pulp out so the patient's not in pain. But believe it or not, when you decarnate the tooth and you get it out of occlusion, that, it's usually the pain that they're having is from the PDL. So if you don't have, if you don't have any, any pain on that uh, tooth, you can give them pain medication, you can give them antibiotics. But if you don't have any pressure on that PDL, that's what they're really having the pain from. Uh, and unless there's pulpal damage, then you can get, uh, get the nerve out. But we like to decarnate the tooth, put a provisional on, and, and preserve that tissue. Remember, the day you track that tooth, you're losing a millimeter of tissue. It's almost inevitable in any anterior case. And one last one. How much time do you spend with the anterior case where you use to suck down? Uh, that's a good, any, like I said earlier, it's four, if it's four units, I leave myself two hours. So the time would be preparation, about 15 minutes, uh, suck down another 10 minutes, and then into proximal closure and polishing for about another, you know, 45 minutes. So. You still got to give yourself, you know, for four units, you got to give yourself two hours. 
Okay, thank you. And what kind of matrix specifically do you use for interproximal contact? The clear matrix, I mean, the ones I used earlier, you saw the clear, it's thin. It's about, a, I think it's about a 60 or 70 micron thickness of thin, uh, clear matrix to make the contacts. Okay. Any more questions out there? Because that was the last one. All right. Looks like all the questions are done. Well, thank okay, you, thank Dr. You, everybody. Jean. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us tonight. Uh, your feedback's important to the AGDs, so we'll appreciate you taking the time to complete an online evaluation. That will be emailed to you later this week. And for more information on upcoming AGD webinars, visit agd.org. Thank you again for joining us. You may now close your browsers. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Okay.